Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Thursday, June 23rd, 2022, and today we are going to be talking about the state of Pennsylvania again. Now, I know we've been talking a lot about the state, but this state is extremely important when it comes down to the balance of power in the U.S. Senate and, of course, the all-important governorship as new laws are set to be uh, putting forth into place following the Supreme Court's expected decision to overturn Roe v. Wade in the next week and a half. What we see in the state of Pennsylvania will be an indicator about the 2024 elections just in terms of enthusiasm, not necessarily as much in terms of outcome of the election, but any election preceding a presidential election does provide needed context and information about how future political candidates might perform. In this state, we have a brand new poll from the AARP, which will tell us some interesting results that show conflicting ones on the generic ballot versus the actual ballots that are being put forth to the voters in the state. It is quite fascinating to take a look at some of these numbers. Some of them you might expect, some of them you might not. So we're going to go ahead and go through it. Now, the reason why I'm making this video is partially because, on one hand, people have said that I probably shouldn't have made a video talking about the singular poll that was released in the state of Pennsylvania, and I would first say that we rarely ever get data from the state of Pennsylvania, at least for this election cycle. And to see some strong polls come from bipartisan sources or nonpartisan sources, it gives us a better idea and understanding about where the race is right now, especially considering how consequential it is. When you take a look at the Senate election map for 2022, you see that we are at a 50-50 standstill in my projection and in terms of current composition, meaning that if Pennsylvania was to go in one direction away from the Democratic Party, Republicans would have the majority in the U.S. Senate. Should Democrats win Pennsylvania, they retain control of the U.S. Senate. This isn't a 2010 or 2014 situation where Democrats are up four seats or even 10 seats. They're only up by a vice president, meaning zero seats. Any change from Democratic leadership to Republican leadership in a U.S. Senate race means automatically, assuming everything else stays the same, that Republicans win control of the U.S. Senate. As for the governorships, it's not super important in terms of an all-nationwide governing body, but it is important in terms of control and in terms of who is going to be dictating laws within the state of Pennsylvania. A very populous state, a swing state, and election laws might be changed due to the governorship won being won by the Republican nominee, Doug Mastriano, who has already come out and promised that should he win his election, he would purge the voter rolls entirely. So taking a look at these polls, we have some very important numbers and ones that are definitely worth talking about. Now, they have some recaps here, which we can go through by the end of it, but I want us to take a look at the 2022 ballots in specific. But before we get into the race, the actual ones that are being questioned and will be tried and tested on the November ballot, I want to first take a look at the generic ballot and Joe Biden's approval rating. Now, nationwide, the generic ballot shows the Republicans ahead by two. Biden is down about 15, 16 points nationwide. So to see the generic ballot at such a, such a different point shows us that Republicans aren't exactly polling as far ahead as they otherwise might like. The numbers that I see in terms of the generic ballot tell us that Republicans are probably going to win the popular vote, but the question isn't going to be, are they going to win by 10 to 15 points, such as the Biden approval rating might indicate, but rather maybe single digits or maybe somewhere around five points. In the state of Pennsylvania, it's the same story. Looking at these numbers here, we find that in the generic congressional ballot, now this is how voters are going to vote on their House race and technically speaking, their Senate race, because that is a congressional race. We find that voters in Pennsylvania favor the Republican Party by two points. Voters uh, 50 plus favor them by five points, independents by 20 points, and looking at many other races here, uh, sorry, many other uh, characterizations and demographic groups here, Republicans do pull far ahead. Now, to see the generic ballot with Republicans plus two, I would also point your direction over to the right side of the screen, where you can see the Biden job approval rating at negative 25, meaning that 25% more voters disapprove of the, the job that Joe Biden is doing than they do approve. 61% of voters disapprove of the job that Joe Biden is doing. That includes 27% of Democrats and 72% of independents. Now, you might be wondering, why are the Democrats still in a close race when Republicans are winning in that category amongst themselves by 82, amongst independents by 20? And I would say that there are more registered Democrats in the state of Pennsylvania. And in terms of the composition, this is typically how it is. And these are also self-reported independents. There aren't always independents in a state. Of course, there can be those who are unaffiliated or technically speaking identify as independent. But realistically speaking, the numbers do average themselves out in many swing states because independent voters, while typically do sway the margins, they can still vote for a Republican by 20 points in terms of a statewide demographic, and they still end up winning the generic ballot by two. That's just how the population and uh, demographic uh, breakdown actually works in Pennsylvania. So Republicans are ahead by two points in the generic congressional ballot. Biden is down by 25. So what does that mean for 2022? 
Well, actually, surprisingly enough, not much. I would say actually not necessarily not much, because had this been a blue wave year, Democrats would have been easily taking away both the Senate races and governorships. But it isn't a blue wave year. It's a red wave year. And right now, the 2022 ballots in the generic congressional ballot and the Biden approval rating show it. But it doesn't show it in terms of the two top ticket items for Pennsylvania voters this midterm season in the governorship and the Senate election, where we see yet again another poll that shows John Fetterman defeating Mehmet Oz in the Senate election and Josh Shapiro defeating Doug Mastriano in the governor election. Josh Shapiro wins by three. John Fetterman wins by six. Now, the margin of error here could be enough to have a Doug Mastriano victory over Josh Shapiro. But in terms of John Fetterman, the margin of error doesn't put it within a reachable distance for Mehmet Oz. And I would say that is important because the margin here for John Fetterman being larger than Josh Shapiro is quite surprising. It happened the first time that a poll was released, and it made sense partially because the primary had just finished and there was no major Republican contender against Doug Mastriano by the end of it. He wasn't slandered and attacked throughout the primary season as Dr. Oz and Dave McCormick were during their uh, primary campaign. And that might be able to explain it now. But as we get closer to the election, if we start to see more numbers that show Shapiro underperforming Fetterman, it will be quite interesting because it's exactly the opposite of what we expected. To give you background, Josh Shapiro won in 2020 in his attorney general's race by about four points statewide, four or five points. And this was a substantial victory because Joe Biden only won the state by about one point. This attorney general's race in Pennsylvania made Josh Shapiro the most voted for candidate in Pennsylvania history. He was coming into 2022 with this electoral mandate following the 2020 attorney general race. He ran unopposed, entirely endorsed by the Pennsylvania Democratic Party versus the Senate election, where Representative Connor Lamb faced off against Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman, and Connor Lamb tried to put forth his best effort in the race, ended up losing the primary by about 30 points, but it was by no means a cleared field. The governor, in which who John Fetterman is the lieutenant governor to, Governor Tom Wolf, refused to endorse in the Senate Democratic primary. That's because people thought this governor election would be a cakewalk and the Senate election would be the hard fought one. And not to say either of them won't be hard fought, but I will say that this is not exactly matching our expectations from the state of Pennsylvania. But regardless, it's a good look for the Democratic Party because Republicans are up in the generic ballot in Pennsylvania by, again, two points. Democrats win this governor race amongst the same voters that favor Republicans by two points by three. They win the Senate election by six. That means you're talking about anywhere from an eight-point overperformance for Democrats to a five-point overperformance. But regardless, this is the same group. These are the same voters who are saying, yep, I'm voting for Republicans, but not on the governorship or Senate election. And that's where it gets very fascinating. Now, in terms of these crosstabs and, breaks, and breakdowns, whatever you want to call it, you can see here that amongst voters, 50 plus are really driving the race to maintain its level of competitiveness for the Democratic Party. Voters 50 plus don't exactly vote this way all the time, specifically in Pennsylvania, certainly not at least in Pennsylvania, didn't vote this way in 2016, didn't vote this way in some important elections. Voters 50 plus seem to be in this position where they are giving the Democratic Party this advantage, maintaining it, because we know, at least historically speaking, that younger voters are the ones that vote for the Democratic Party, which shows it's a close race all around, but without voters 50 plus, Democrats don't have it. They typically rely on younger voters, but now they need every demographic group. But when we're looking at the numbers amongst Republicans, this is where it gets quite interesting. Because amongst Republicans, John Fetterman is getting 13% of the vote. Amongst Democrats, Oz is only getting 8%. For the Republicans and Democrats on the governorship, 8% to Doug Mastriano for Republicans. Amongst, uh, for him, amongst Democrats, Josh Shapiro is getting 11% of Republicans. Meaning that Shapiro and Fetterman are outperforming the Republican opponents amongst their group. We typically see this happen in almost every poll, where there are 8 to 10% of Democrats that just haven't changed their party affiliation, but are questioned and interviewed as Democrats. Same thing with the Republicans. And you see it with a small portion and fragment of the voting population. But it seems to be at least a little bit more significant here because there is a difference in the results. There is a difference in what we see in the generic, in the governor and Senate ballot. If we go back to the generic ballot and take a look at how voters are going to vote, Amongst Democrats and Republicans, while well, you take a look at this generic ballot, 6% of Republicans are voting for Democrats, 8% of Democrats are voting for Republicans. And that's really where you can start to see that narrow difference make up a margin that might otherwise not be there. And also just isn't just that. 
You take a look at voters, men 50 plus, you find that it's closer in the Senate election than the governorship. You look at women 50 plus, you find it more expansive for Democrats in the Senate election than the governorship. A lot of this can explain John Fetterman's ability to outperform Josh Shapiro, and a lot of these numbers can explain why Democrats are maintaining their leads in the state of Pennsylvania, despite the generic ballot nationally and locally to be against them. Now, I take a look at these candidate image numbers, and I also see exactly where the problem lies for the GOP. They simply didn't nominate their best. To put everything back into context for you, understand where we are. The 2020 House elections were decided by three points nationwide, and Democrats got 222 seats, a five-seat majority that has now narrowed down to four seats following a Texas special election. This was a three-point victory. You go back to 2018, this was an eight-point victory for the Democratic Party. You go back to 2016, this was a one-point victory for the GOP. The ability for the Republican Party to win has been defined by their ability to masterfully gerrymander every single state they can. And not to say Democrats don't, because they absolutely do, both parties do this, but Republicans have very much an unequal distribution of seats that they drew in 2022 and could draw in the future because of the state legislatures that they control, because of the governorships that they have, because of their overall power across many, many states. To see a one-point victory translate into a larger victory in the House for the GOP than what is an eight-point victory nationwide explains everything you need to know about why redistricting and gerrymandering is so important for our nation. And if Republicans are to be ahead by more than one point, you could be looking at a House majority similar to this one, if not worse. And to understand that in terms of the context of Pennsylvania, this doesn't make sense. Democrats should not be ahead in a state just as close as this one. When you go back to 2014 or 2010, and you were to take any state that Barack Obama won by a margin similar to this one or even slightly higher, you would find that that still translated to Republican victories. Why? Because it was a red wave year. In 2022, despite it being a red wave year and in a Biden state that only went to him by 1.2%, Republicans aren't taking it away with us. And there's a reason for that. But I want you to understand that they absolutely should be. This should not even be in contention. Republicans should be in a likely Republican, potentially safe Republican characterization if we went back 10 years ago to 2010 or 12 years ago. We went back eight years ago to 2014. Apply the same exact race that we are in right now with the same exact positioning for the GOP, with the same candidates, potentially speaking, or not necessarily the same candidates, different candidates where there's at least a mediocre or somewhat strong Republican and just a Democrat who was offered up as a sacrificial lamb. While Tom Wolf did well in 2014, I would say he's an exception to the rule. And we've seen it for Republicans in the state of Pennsylvania and many other states across the nation in 2014. Even my home state of Maryland, which went to Obama by 25, flipped Republican in 2014. That's how beneficial the national environment was. Republicans should be winning by seven, eight, nine points across the state, yet they're losing. And it comes down to this exact question about favorability and candidate image. Because Josh Shapiro across the state of Pennsylvania is favored 13 points above those who view him unfavorably. Doug Mastriano, on the other hand, is down seven points. When you take a look at John Fetterman, he has a plus 10 favorability rating. Dr. Oz, negative 33. Amongst Republicans, one in three Republicans, in fact, more than that, have an unfavorable view of Dr. Oz. Why might that be? Well, he wasn't popular in the first place. He ran as someone who was propped up by the former president who nobody wanted to run in the first place. This is why this is a bad look for the GOP and why they are losing the Senate and governorship. These should be otherwise easily winnable races. I mean, I cannot stress that enough because never two years ago would I have told you that Pennsylvania was going to stay blue knowing where the generic ballot was. Maybe back then when Biden was riding high in terms of his bump in approval or less than two years ago, obviously a year and three months ago, four months ago, whatever you want to say, when you see Joe Biden's honeymoon approval rating, when you take a look at the generic ballot back then when Democrats are up six, seven points, maybe I could have said that. And I probably did say that. And that made sense at the time. But if you were to give me a scenario and say that the Republicans were up two points nationwide, Biden was down 16 points nationwide, he's down, you know, plus uh, he's down 30 points in Pennsylvania, Republicans are up two points across the state, I would have told you Republicans were going to easily take away these races. And yet they aren't. And they have no one else to blame but themselves. The Pennsylvania Republican primary nominated the wrong people. I don't know who's to blame. I 
don't like to blame voters for things, but I will say that they could have made better choices in terms of electability. I think maybe Doug Mastriano and Oz represented the values of more Republican voters than the other candidates did. But at the end of the day, when it comes down to electability, these were clearly the wrong choices. And Democrats really lucked out. If this was a blue wave year, we're talking likely safe blue characterizations. Easily. That should be happening right now for the GOP. And it isn't. For all the reasons we mentioned previously. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already and check out the Instagram and Twitter. At the bottom left of the screen, there's also a Discord server for you to go ahead and join. On the screen, there's a video you can watch and then a playlist for my 2022 election analysis videos. Again, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all later today.